Everybody's getting hungry here. They come back to life. Yay! One oh. more. Alright, everybody give them a hand. Yay. Well, about Andrew, when he first came, <coughs> I remember when I heard, I think you came with Crystal Dane. Yeah, my friend Crystal had brought him and she's like, hey girl, he's artistic too. I'm like, what, really? That's so cool. And, <laughs> and like, in getting to know him more, and yes, I want to get to know him more. And even on his birthday when I celebrate his life with him, I do want to get to know him more and more because we're, we're put here and we grow and grow together. And one of the amazing things that I find about Andrew is that Although we might not, I will, although I might not see him that often as church as I would like to, like just to talk to him and such. I always see him like keep wanting more and more and more, and even like even through faith, when like, even through faith, he keeps walking, he keeps trying, and I, I admire that. And once more, uh, what? Oh God! Oh. <laughs> I thought that was good. Yeah. <laughs> just in case. But, um, yeah, Andrew, I want to say happy birthday, and I'm glad that you're a part of our family. Thank you for Thank coming you. and being a part of our lives. Thank you. Happy birthday, Andrew. Happy birthday. Andrew, anybody want to say something to little Andrew? Yeah, me and him may have our fights here and there, but he's still my little brother, and I still love him. And oh. We've been through everything together, literally, oh, and, so <coughs> and I love you, Andrew. Uh, Andrew. Andrew. You're a nice guy. You have such a tender heart. I love it when you come around because uh, you're such a stud. <laughs> <laughs> He's the next uh, movie star and is uh, showing a lot of chest when you come in. Uh, Andrew, we love you. We are looking forward to years, more years to come uh, with you being here. I don't know where you're going to college, but just know you always have a home here. You know, and uh, wherever you go, we, you know. Part of you, you're a part of us. We want to share life with you, and uh, we love you. So God bless you this day, little little Andrew. Little Andrew, one quality I, I, I find uh, interesting that I love about you is that uh, it's how you're you're a little guy, but you always look out for your brother. You know, I, I think that's really awesome. Um, he reminds me of uh, Scrappy Dude. You guys remember Scrappy? Little, little dog, all big and tough. That's, that's what he reminds me of. God bless you, Andrew. Andrew, and Andrew. Hey, why don't you guys stand up and flex your muscles? Both of y'all. Just be funny. Andrew, stand up with next to him. Just flex, flex, flex with him. Okay. Come on. Just don't take off your shirt. Come on, Andrew. Hey, show us your, your karate moves. Come on, Andrew. Show us your karate moves. I'm really glad I got to come to this church when my mom came just get accepted into this youth. I'm really excited for just the family relationship that I'm going to build with everybody here because I know I'm going to get to people and like even if I don't talk to you now, even if I haven't said a word to you yet, I'm going to get to you because I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you guys for the birthday party. Hey, he's both doing my hand. 
do you guys have your Bibles out? Yes, mine yeah. are. You guys ready to turn to the first verse, John 15, 15? Please. <laughs> I do not call you slaves anymore because a slave doesn't know what his, what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything I, he I have heard from my father. So reading in John 15, 15, it says, No longer do I call you servants. So I'm losing. And you know, you're, you are kind of, Okay, Lord, what can I do for you? Like, I know you. What can I do for you? Um, and you don't know all the things and all the plans that he has for you. And, um, you know, and so it's like, you know that, okay, once you were servants, because it says, no longer do I call you servants. And so now he's telling you, letting you know that there is another level into this relationship. I, I want to call you guys friends. I want to show you the things um, that are not known to other people, you know, but because you guys are my friends now, servants don't know the plans of his masters. But I call you guys friends. I want to be able to share what the Father has me doing, and I want to be able to do it with you again, co-laboring. Um, and uh, so now that you know that there is another relationship with God, you can actually pray to God and ask Him, "Hey Lord, um, I know that you love me, and I know that you want to reveal things to me, and you say that you want to be my friend. So can you?" Can you teach me? Can you show me? Can you enlighten me? Open my eyes and let me see. Hello? And, uh, you know, again, another aspect of friendship, um, you know, with, I guess, in John 15, 13, just two verses before that, if you guys just look at it, it says, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And what did Jesus do? He laid down his life for us. So it's like not only does he love us, but he really, I mean, he enjoys us. And he loves us as a friend. He would lay down his life for us. And he was describing this an aspect of friendship. But of course, there's a lot of aspects in the relationship with God. So there are mysteries that God has. And there's so many mysteries in the Word of God and His work is living. Um, without the Spirit of God, we won't know anything. Um, we, we actually won't be able to grasp the things that He is saying to us. It would just be another book, another story. But He's living and He's Spirit. And so when we read these words, we, you know, we we come to know more about Him. And not only that, there's there's a dialogue going on. When you read His Word, He's speaking to you these mysteries. You don't fully understand it. So then what you do is you ask him, okay, what does that mean? So there's a dialogue going on, and whenever you're speaking back or you're asking God anything or you're talking to him, you're, you're praying to him. So, I mean, praying is really easy, really simple. Um, so I want to actually go to the book of Genesis and talk about the story of Abraham and um, Sodom and Gomorrah. So uh, flip to Genesis 18... And then we'll go to the, we'll start with verse 17. Okay, you guys there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Alright, so you guys, a lot of you guys know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's a sinful city and God desires to destroy it. Um, so before he actually does so, if you were to look in Genesis 18, 17. Um, Kevin, you want to read that? Just okay. 18, 17. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what, am I, what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Okay, yeah. So God is planning this thing out. He's like, okay, I've heard the cries of the people, and the city is sinful, and they're not repenting, and they're not turning away from their sins. And so he has this plan, he has to destroy it, God's judgment, he has to do it, blood cries out. And so then he's contemplating, he's like, should I, 
should I tell Abraham what I'm about to do? You know, he's my friend. I, you know, he's, I, I want to tell him. So, and he, he's going to be a, a great person. He's going to be a leader, of, um, a father of many nations, a father of many. And so that's when he actually reveals, you know, if you were to read further on, he reveals what he's doing um, to Abraham. And, you know, as a friend, again, you know, when you go to John 15, he says, you know, I, I will, you know, I'll let them, servants don't know the plans of um, his master, but I call you friends. And so now he has a friendship with Abraham. And he tells Abraham what he's about to do. And so when God tells you what he's about to do, when he reveals it through dreams or visions, or even somebody has dreams or visions and they come to you, there is a revealing of something. And when there's a revealing, God really also desires you to, to pray at the same time. Um, so God didn't have to tell Abraham his plan, um, but he does desire mercy. God is a merciful God. So it's like, I know that blood cries out, but if there's somebody who would just pray and would just ask, I desire to do it. So then he, so not only does he want to share this with his friend Abraham, but he also wants and he desires somebody to stand in the gap for them so that he can really, he desires mercy, so he wants to save these people. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's, if there's any good in them, then he wants to do so, but, you know, he needs somebody, he needs a vessel, he needs us to be the voice to pray for him, and that releases, you know, what he desires to do. So one of the things that God does as a friend, he has a desire in his heart to do these things. So when he shares it with you, he wants you to be able to ask him and co-labor and do this with him. Okay, so then on verse 22, yeah, it's, it's still the cha same chapter, 18, but we're really going to dissect the story, one part of the story. So then, because he, he saw the angels... And um, God told him the plan. And so the angels left to go to Sodom. But Abraham stood before the Lord. So Abraham was, a, he was, I don't understand, I don't know, if, probably not in his full glory, maybe so, all in his glory. But he stood before the Lord. You know, as I am standing before you guys. You know, like, we're friends, we're close. There's nothing that is hidden from well, from God, really, or from Him. God knows all things. Um, but with the natural eye, I mean, I'm, I'm here in the flesh. And so God, like, in the beginning with Adam, he's, He says He stood before the Lord, and so He was before Him. There was, there was no... He didn't have to stand behind the veil or anything. There's this friendship and this intimacy that they have. And um, so what Abraham does... You know, God reveals it to him, and he's like, Lord, if there's, you know, if there's 50 people who are, you know, righteous, will you spare them? And then he's like, okay, yes, I will. And then so, and then he again, if there's 40 people, will you spare them? He said, yes, I will. And then if, so then he boldly continued to ask, you know. So he has confidence in this relationship that he has, and he continues to inquire. He could have just stopped, okay, I think 40 people is just, you know, too much, you know. You know, he could have just stopped there, but there is a relationship and confidence he has in the Lord that he says, okay, let's just push it further. Lord, if there's ten people, will you spare them? And he says, yes. And so God, if it wasn't for Abraham inquiring these things, asking the Lord, then, you know, his, his, um, his cousin, Lot, yeah. would have not... I mean, probably have been destroyed in Sodom because it was just a sinful place and everybody would have died. But Abraham, through praying that, he actually, he, God spared a lot in his family. Um, mm -hmm. There was um, something that I was listening um, in Chris Valentin, and I like what he says. He says that mysteries can't be discovered, they can only be revealed. And uh, so the mysteries of God, sometimes we don't fully understand a lot of things. 
and we tried to come up with answers, um, tried to connect things with our own intellect, though, without kind of just waiting on God and seeking Him out. But God says, you know, if you seek me, then you find me. And then you want to find the truth, you have to seek the truth. You don't try to seek your own intellect, but you really seek God and what He's trying to unravel. So, you know, these mysteries of God can only be answered, or the true answers can only come from God Himself. Um, so if you think that you can try to, you know, find these mysteries, they're, they're given, they're, they're a gift, and He desires to give it to you. If you seek Him, then He'll give it to you. But along with just, you know, God giving us these, um, unraveling these mysteries, there's also that spiritual discipline that's very important. So, I mean, even in the waiting, there's still, you know, um, you still have to try to press in with God. Again, when you're sitting and you're waiting, you have to actively listen um, and just wait on Him. So, um, Bob Sorg breaks it down like this, and I, uh, I like it, so I just want to share it with you guys. It says that um, with spiritual discipline, it starts with how you apply yourself to the disciplines of prayer. So prayer is important. Adoration, adoring God. And then gazing, gazing on His beauty, gazing on Him. And then fasting, which um, allows us to uh, enlarges our capacity to receive from Him. And then reading, reading the Word of God, reading His truth, and then studying um, his word and then meditating on it so you don't just read it you study it and then you meditate on it so you just keep on chewing the word over and over and over there should always be a delight in his word and then of course listening to God what is he saying um, and then just ab absorbing the truth just taking in what you receive you know you take a moment okay Lord I'm studying and then I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying so now I'm receiving what you're saying so that it'll be, it'll be, um, it'll be life to me. So I can actually walk this out. Okay. So it's really important that you apply these disciplines in your life, um, so that you know you. God always talks about the intimacy, and you don't want anything to rob you from getting deeper in Him or a deeper level of intimacy with Him. So, so we know that um, God desires to show Himself to us. He He desires, um, and it actually says that He desires to show Himself strong to us. So we we trust in Him, and He will show Himself strong to us in. Um, just flip to Second Chronicles sixteen nine. And let me know when you guys are there, please. Second. Second Chronicles sixteen nine. I'm there. All right, Andy, would you like to read it, please? Sure. 16, 9. It's going to be in a different term. Uh, yeah. Okay, someone else should read it. I read it. Okay. Just standing for me? Yeah, 16, 9. It's your favorite verse. Oh, mm -hmm. one of your favorite verses. Oh. oh, yeah. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to show himself strong for those whose hearts are completely his. You have been foolish in this matter, for from now on, you will have wars. The first part of it, yeah, the, first part of it. <laughs> the first part of it, God desired to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. So it's like your heart has, again, a yes in your heart. You desire to go hard after God. And, you know, even though you don't understand fully a lot of things, but God will, God will, God desires to show himself strong. He desires to to let you know that you're protected and that he's your Lord and that he he can protect you. And if you just trust and continue just to to just walk with him, he he can fulfill the promises that he's promised you. Okay. 
Let's go to the story of Mary, another aspect of um, a friend. So we know that in a friendship relationship, we desire to tell each other what's going on in our day. You know, the good, the bad, and whatever else. So, but just the fact that we desire to tell our friend what's going on. Mm -hmm. So you saw that in, um, you saw that with Abraham and God. So now we're going to Mary and Jesus in John 11.32. I'm going to tell you guys a little bit of the background, what's going on. So, um, before we talk about Mary, um, we know that in this chapter, um, Mary and Martha's brother, Lazarus, has just passed. And so, Jesus is actually coming to them to raise Lazarus back up. So, in the process, when he enters into town, um, Martha meets him. And... Um, And I'm, I'm, I'm just going to read it. So it says, um, So Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. So, okay, we know that she does believe and she does trust in God. That she has faith that whatever God asks the Father, that he can do it. Same thing. So when you go down to Mary, so when Mary came to him, um, verse, verse 32 says, Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you've been here, my brother would have not died. She, Martha came to him, and she showed her faith. But all Mary did, she came to him and she just fell to her knees and she just wept. And she said, Lord, if you've been here, he would have not died. She didn't say anything else, but she just cried. And that cry was also like a prayer, you know. And the Holy Spirit makes everything known to Jesus. So it's, so, and in the friendship, whenever, whenever your friend is hurting, you know, it moves you. And so... We know that Jesus loved, in verse 5, it says Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. But Jesus was moved when, Ma when he saw Mary and she was weeping before him. She just fell to her, her feet and she just, she just cried. And she's like, Lord, if you've been here, my brother would have not died. And then so he was moved in. It says on uh, verse 33, therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. So he wept. And he, he already knows his plan. He already knows that Lazarus was going to be rose from the dead. But he still wept. A relationship and a friendship whatever your burdens are, it moves God. God knows his plan that he's going to do. But just imagine that your tears move God, that you have a relationship with him, that when you speak, he desires to answer you. Not that he doesn't, but again, I mean, there is a process. There is that spiritual discipline that allows you to a larger capacity to receive from him. And when you have this relationship with him, it moves him. Whenever you speak, whenever you're joyful, you don't have to have an elaborate song. But when you sing with your heart, it moves him. He delights in it. And so when you cry and there's like a burden in your heart, you, it doesn't take so many prayers and a whole long list of, you know, Lord, you should do this because of this. You know, I'm, I've been faithful. My, I know you love my brother, etc. and stuff. It's just little little things if you just stand before him he's just he will be moved by you because he knows the deep things that you're going through or the things that you desire and he knows that mary was was weeping and she was 
not only broken, but she was really hurt. She just lost a brother. And, and so this fly that she had, it moved him. And um, so yeah, and uh, to tag on with what Andy said, I mean, Mary, the story of Mary, it's never going to be forgotten. I mean, the little things she does, I mean, she doesn't do much. She doesn't have to, to say much. All she does is she just, she sits before the Lord. She listens. And then she's, again, she falls to her feet and she just cries. These little things, she doesn't do much, but they're just, they are important to him. And he writes them down. And she's not forgotten. You know, so the little things you guys do, they're not forgotten. He delights in, in you guys. And the little things that you do and the processes that you guys go through from the first time that you met him to your, the process of enduring this faith that you have with him and the desire and the, the growth to want to know him more and stuff. Um, so Jesus, um, he shares in, you know, when we cry, he's moved. And he's also, he also, a friend of God also is joyful when he's joyful and whatever plan he has for his church, etc. So we'll, we'll go to the joyful part in John 3.29. is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. The friend of the bridegroom. Just imagine Jesus is the bridegroom, and he what does he long for? He longs for his bride or his church to be blemish free and to really stand in the authority to be able to co-reign with him and to see her in all her glory, the glory that Jesus has given her, or God has given her. And being a friend of the bridegroom, we made that process, you know, happen because God needs a vessel to be able to pray for his bride and for his church. <coughs> and, and you stand there and you, also, you rejoice with him. Though you don't fully see what he sees, you don't see the reason why he loves his bride. You may not understand it. But as a friend of Christ, we rejoice when we see God rejoicing. A lot of times we don't have to fully understand everything that he desires to do, but we know, okay, he, he enjoys, he delights in that, okay. All right, I will, I will, I will do it with him. Well, I'll, I'll help him make it happen. Not that he needs our help, but... You know, he does desire a vessel to be able to pray so that he can make it happen. He doesn't have to use you, but he does need to use a vessel. Um, so he rejoices. So we rejoice when we hear his voice and we hear, we know that he is rejoicing. And when you tap into agreement with that um, celebration, it fills you with joy at the same time. So whenever you have a relationship with a friend, whenever another friend is happy and you tap into that joy with them, then somehow you're just filled with joy. Even though you didn't experience it, but you love them. And so you somehow you're just filled with joy because you're happy for them. And, you know, and so it says, therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. There's this joy that desires to be fulfilled and it's fulfilled when you tap into agreement with that joy. Whenever, you know, whenever a person um, has been struggling with um, a sin and suddenly he breaks free from that, even though it wasn't your struggle, but you know, you know that they've been struggling. Because you, you have, a, again, you have a friendship relationship with them. And so when you, you hear the good news and you hear that what God has been doing in their lives, 
and it just broke them free. You just rejoice. You rejoice at the pain and all that, all those hours that have been bounding them. They're they're set free. You you rejoice in that. And of course, you also rejoice in the goodness of God because they're a living testimony. And so it's just then your joy is just really it's it's fulfilled. So I mean, relationship, a friendship relationship, sharing and all the things that you know you guys you guys do sharing into you guys life it's not a friendship shouldn't just be you know how are you how was your day it was good how are you <laughs> you know it shouldn't just be like that there should be a deeper relationship and you know if you feel like there is something if there's a wall that's kind of making that not happen um, hindering that process you know just pray and ask God I desire to be friends with them you know, I, I love to see their life. I just don't know why I'm not able to to love on them or to to be friends with them the way that I desire to be because there's such a deeper level of friendship, of relationship. And whenever you, you know, with one another, whenever you guys enter into that friendship level, when you fight for one another or when you pray with one another to get through a certain struggle or whenever you guys rejoice with one another it really it takes you into another deeper level with God because then you're able to actually see okay God this is what you're talking about when you say you know fight for your friends or lay down your life for your friends this is what you're talking about okay I'm, I'm kind of experiencing it now you know like hands-on so so these are things that God God teaches you and he, he he desires to be friends with you, and he's a very, you know, he's a God who, who is just really easy to draw close and close into relationship. He doesn't, he's not a scary God or anything. He desires to be friends with you, you know. Um, Andy helped me look up a verse in John about just John leaning on, um, on uh, Jesus' chest. Yeah, I mean... So I mean, God is God is that um, He's that good. He desires intimacy, and you know, and His disciples are not afraid of Him. They love Him, and and so it's like now there's there was leaning on Jesus, was one of His disciples whom Jesus loved. Jesus loved him, and and he loved and he was comfortable with Jesus to be leaning on his chest. So God desires relationship and He desires to be your friend. And hopefully I learned something. Okay. You guys appreciate twin? Yes. Um guys look at me, look at me, look at me. I need a... Albert, Albert, I need your eyes. I need your eyes. I'm going to close. You know, I was thinking really quick while Twin was talking how sad and terrible, terrifying actually, and almost stupid it is. And I want to use these words very carefully that the most beautiful person, the most tender, the most loving, willing to lay down his life for us. The most amazing person who wants to relate to us face to face, intimately. How sad it is that people only use him for fire insurance because they don't want to go to hell. So they come to him just for what he can do for them and not for friendship. That is terrifying. Yet it's true that most of the body of Christ, most Christians, only use God. They only relate to Him on what He can do for them and what they get out of Him. And you know, I'm thinking about that. I'm sitting there thinking about that. I think, God, how can this be? This is... This is the worst sin, I think, for a Christian to commit. How can we go so low? How can we be so selfish? And I don't like to use the word stupid, but 
truly you can use the word stupid here. How did the devil get us into so much religion that we only use God for our own games? Where we should really truly give him every part, every minute, every second of our life. That is the only correct and right way to respond to this person. How many guys agree with me? Do, am I making any sense? It's such a tragedy, yet it's true. Do you know that God has very few friends? He only has a lot of His own people who use Him. How many guys do not want to be in that boat when you stand before Jesus? Say, God, I live for you a little bit. Thank you for saving me. I don't have to burn in hell. But you know, God, I mostly live for myself and for what I look like in front of people. I am sorry, God. That would be the worst tragedy that could ever happen to... I mean, if I was that person, I would like, God, kill me before I backslide. Please, I don't want to live with a cold heart, with no desire for your word, only want to do what I want to do, never really sacrificing my time and my own desires to hear from you, sit at your feet, worship you. To learn to enjoy you and rest on your breast as a way of life. That would be so terrible. I don't know what's going on, but I, I feel this, this, this ache. I think I'm feeling God's heart. It's broken because of this. Because you and I know it's true. God has a broken heart. How can that be? He's God. How can his heart break? It breaks all the time. And I believe he's pleading today. And I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying, Will you be my friend? But God, I am your friend. Will you be closer friend to me? Will you be my best friend? But there's so many people I can be your best friend. He's God. He can do whatever He wants. I feel like God says, God is saying to you, will you be my best friend? You know you can have a best friend in the natural, but in the spirit, you can have God as your best friend as well. Lord, would you draw us closer to you? <coughs> Lord, you even said that you hide yourself from those who casually come to you. You hide your mysteries, your secrets. It is, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. What is that? It is your glory that you hide yourself, you hide your wisdom, you hide your truth from people who casually seek you. But it's the glory of kings to search it out. Lord, I pray that there would be kings in this house who would search you out. Who would not only search for you, who only come to you and seek you when they need something. Because they need some peace, they need some joy, they need some hope. That's great. That's, that's what we do. But Lord, God, would you raise up a people? who would come and say, Lord, today, what can I do to make you happy? What can I do to, to return as it, to, to, to offer my life to you, to, to give you what brings you joy because I know who you are. I know how beautiful you are, how, how you relate to me, how you are committed to me. How you can enjoy me in my weakness and I deserve nothing of this sort yet you want to give it to me because it is who you are. God, what can I do to bring a smile to your face? What, what can I do to just to, to bless you? Lord, 
Raise up a people that are done with the bless me gospel. And Lord, that delight in the bless you gospel, Lord. That they would live to lay down their life, their comforts, their, their selfishness. Just to bring joy to your heart. That long to be your friend, Lord. Lord, we know that in life, we, we can't stand friends that use us all the time. But some people we love the most, and when they use us, we get so angry. And yet, Lord, we know we always use you. There's times in our life we only lose you, and when we don't get what we want, we get mad at you. God, please don't let us be selfish. We get mad at God, and we don't get up. Yet, if you really look at how good you have it, the richest guy on earth who has everything he wants doesn't have it as good as you unless he knows he's not going to end up in eternity that burns your heart. And yet, we who get spared and God likes to relate to us personally can become so selfish sometimes. We come in here sometimes and we're like, thinking about ourselves. We go to church thinking about ourselves. We, in our friendship. How many of you guys know that if you have a, if you're in a friendship and you come to take instead of give, that friendship is going to be broken sooner or later. And maybe this is the reason why some of our relationships with God here have been kind of messed up. We come just to take and we don't give. Everybody say it's time to give. You got something to give, right? Yeah. Well, does he want your money? Does he need my money? Does he need my good looks? Does he need my uh, smarts? Does he need my... No, he doesn't really need any of that. What does he want from me? Love. Your friendship. Which is love, yeah. He wants to be your friend. be a friend of God. Everything else is overrated. A friend of the world will only leave me empty. I'm going to ask you a simple question. What will you give to be a friend of God? God's friend, but I don't really don't want to give him my attention. That sounds really crazy. But it speaks louder than words. I want to be a friend of God, but you know, I really don't have time for him. I really don't have time to get to know him and his word. You see what I'm saying, guys? Don't stand up because you feel like you're going to look stupid if you don't. Or don't stand up because everybody else is standing up. Don't, and this is not a, a challenge or... And this is not anything to, 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 to prove to anybody anything. But my simple question is... Very simple.
not on self. Another way of saying is, will you live to bring him joy? Will you choose to live? Will, will your joy, let's say it in a better way, is, will, you, will your decision life, that you, will you make a decision life that your joy is his joy? When he's happy, you are happy. And it is really a call to be a friend of God. And if that's you, I want you to stand to your feet. I said, Lord, mark me today. Yes, this is my me today. Don't feel bad if you're sitting down. Now, I I want us to <coughs> to realize that we're not just standing in front of Stephen and the youth leaders trying to do something good and noble, but we're standing before Almighty God with a, an eternal decision that He will has written down in a book and will come knocking on our door and say, you remember when you said you lived to be my friend and that you live for my joy instead of your own selfish desires? Do you remember that? Can I come and meet you on that vow that you made? You guys get what I'm saying? I want you to close your eyes and in, in faith, in the Spirit, you're standing before Almighty God. And His arms are wide open. And He's inviting you. His invitation is an invitation to sit on His lap and listen to His heartbeat. I want you to listen to what He would have say to you right now and I want you to respond everybody's going to respond differently and I want you to softly speak to him the commitment of your heart today I'm not going to give you a a verse or a, a, a way to say whatever you but before God you can whisper it to him tell him from your heart in response to the word that was given, what your commitment is right now. Just whisper to him. And if you, when you get done, if you feel like been pretty selfish relating to him mostly maybe not mostly but a lot of times for your own needs only you don't really, you only come to him a lot and you say God and you know maybe it's a little maybe it's a lot it doesn't matter and it doesn't matter what anybody thinks okay? I want you to lift your hand saying God I've been kind of selfish I'm raising my hand too okay? I'm your pastor confessing that I've been selfish in many ways in my relationship with God and I confess before all of you that I'm turning from my selfishness. I'm turning from just relating to God for what I need. But I want to relate to Him. I want to come to Him and relate to Him on behalf of what brings Him joy, what makes Him happy, and not only what makes me happy. So you, if you can make this shift right now in the spirit, you're going to have so much joy because you know what? God is the happiest person. And if you can relate to Him, and if your joy, if His joy becomes your joy, you'll be the happiest person that ever walked the face of the earth. The only reason why we're not joyful is because really selfishness. But when we get out of ourselves and our joy becomes His joy, and His joy becomes ours, be the most delightful. We don't walk around with a permanent smile. Some of these people that walk around smiling all the time, you wonder why? Because they've already given up their selfishness. You see what I'm saying, guys? So let's just lift our hands to God, we surrender selfishness. Yes, Lord. Surrender that to just, you, God. Just relate it to you, Lord. Lord, anybody that just 
if you're bold and you feel like it's you, just say, Lord, I've been selfish. I haven't been a good friend. I haven't been a good friend. I just haven't been a good friend. I just want to take from you. I just want to take and from you. And I haven't given. And I haven't given. I withheld. I withheld. If you withheld, you know you withheld, you know. He said some things to you and you just want to, don't want to do it. And you know, you know it's right and you want to do it. You do, you have withheld from your friend. Lord, I withheld, Lord, I confess to you. Yes. Lord, let me go first. Yes. This morning I, I want to tell you, uh, I had a dream this morning that that I was coming out of this fenced area. It was like fenced me in, and I saw a a hole really low on the ground that you have to stoop down, which speaks of humility, to get out. I was fenced in, and there were guards everywhere. And I saw an escape, okay? And the only way I can go through this, I knew I had to humble myself. When you stoop down in a dream, it means you're humbling yourself. And I can escape, I can get out of this fence, okay? But in the dream, I grabbed a friend of mine. Now, dreams are symbolic. It was some girl that I was really close to back then. And I kissed her. It wasn't a bad, you know, sensual thing. It was symbolic. It meant we were in agreement. It meant that we were intimate and in agreement. And I helped her through this fence. And I woke up. I believe that God has given me some freedom. I'm going to tell you what it means if you can take this. I believe God has given me some freedom. And uh, you who call me a teacher or a pastor or whatever that is if you'll come into agreement with me I'm going to help you get out of this fence situation it, just, it was like an institution that we were in it speaks of bondage it speaks of oppression it speaks of just just uh, you know mundaneness okay I want to help you but the key here is we had to both humble ourselves. We had to bow really low to get out. But we had to do it together. That's why a lot of times when God convicts me of something, I always confess it to you guys. It really doesn't matter to me. You, you understand what I'm saying? Now there's some really personal stuff I talk to. I always talk to one of my friends who are close to me. You know? They know everything. These guys here. They actually know all my weaknesses and everything I struggle with. They know it all. And they still love me. And they still love me. Okay? <laughs> so, I want to tell you guys that it is a good way to live. Anyway. Alright, I'm done. <laughs> did, you, did you guys feel, feel yeah. good or released yeah. today? Yeah. I feel like God is... You ever been in a relationship? He used me. What do you think how God feels? She used me. She just wanted my money. Just imagine how God feels. Every day, Christians. Shh. Yeah. Now imagine that person was the kindest person, the most adorable person, and you realized that you really hurt that person. You really used that person. Wouldn't there be some kind of pricking in your heart? Well, God, He can take it. Yeah, I can take it. But it really sucks. That's terrible. That would be considered betrayal in a relationship. So why don't we just confess our betrayal to the Lord too? Lord, we have betrayed you in our relationship. Forgive us. Break the power of betrayal. I dreamed I was in the driveway. I was in the driveway, and um, Seth was there, but I didn't yes. see exactly where he was. And 
there was a black truck in the driveway and he was resting under that black truck all curled up and the the truck had I knew the truck had pulled out and I was I, I didn't know that he was under the truck I didn't know where he was and so I was like Seth Seth and then suddenly I'm in the street and there are these signs these markers you know how they have like the caution signs and different signs there was these whatever it was, on the way of a walk to school. It's a walk to school where little kids walk by themselves to school. And the signs were in the middle of the street. And I was seeing all these markers. And I was like, where's, where's my son? Where's my son? And um, suddenly I was back to where the house was. And I saw my set. And I was, like, I was like, Seth, were you under the truck? And I, I was like, did you get run over? And he was like, yeah. And, and somehow, even though he got run over, um, he, he was... He was in between the wheels or in some kind of way where he didn't get hurt. Like, I thought he could die, like he was so not safe, but even though it wasn't a safe situation, he was still protected. And so when I saw him, I was so thankful that he was okay, even though the situation wasn't a good situation. And um, I asked him, you know, when I asked him if he was under there, and he explained to me that, that he had gotten in between the wheels and he was okay, then I was so relieved. So usually those are bad. Oh, but, uh, so you guys, listen, if, 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 if you really care about yourself, you want to listen to this because Seth is you. Seth is you. But, I think he had a red blanket too. Because the Holy Spirit has covered his love over you, yeah. even though life, the enemy, a mad truck, Black truck. Black truck. The spirit of death. All the things, the bad things you can think of is that truck has tried to run you over. You were protected. And you were kept safe. So pray, let's praise God. Thank you, Lord, for protecting us. You know what? I'm sure it I'm sure there are other symbols, there's other sets that we're so fortunate.